HIV specifically has been really safe in many, many gene therapy trials, including um, over 200 patients have been treated with this for, for brain um, related uh, diseases. The other major benefit is that this is, uh, has a, a durable effect, meaning that um, the idea, with, especially with Parkinson's and putting something directly in the brain, it's a one-time procedure with nothing more to do. So it's a one and done sort of situation, which is unique. So no, nothing you would take every day or do more than once. So um, as of this month, um, there are only two gene therapy studies that are active in recruiting patients for, with Parkinson's disease. So one of them is this AVGBA. So this is um, from, from a company called Prevail. And basically they're looking for patients with Parkinson's disease that have a mutation in this gene called GBA. GBA is involved in clearing out um, junked up proteins like alpha synuclein, which I think some of you may know about. And so the idea is that they're giving back a good copy of um, that doesn't have a mutation of this GBA in order to see if they can help clear out some of the things like um, the alpha synuclein. And I, I talk about that here in a second. Um, the other one that's open right now is this AV GDNF. Um, and the goal with GDNF is that it functions as a growth factor. And so the idea is that this is um, for neuroprotection and also to slow down disease progression. So I'm just gonna talk about these two. There are a few others, and um, I, I know there are a few on this call who have been part of a different study, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about if there's questions, um, but these are the only two that are open right now. So I, I was gonna focus here for today. Um, now, one of the big issues when it comes to gene therapy for Parkinson's specifically is that um, how you deliver the gene therapy makes all the difference. So we're going to talk kind of about two of them today. One, the, that GBA um, gene therapy, they're doing it this way. So they're putting it in the fluid around the brain and they're going really in the, the back of the neck for this one. Whereas um, the GDNF one is going direct into a part of the brain called the putamen. And uh, I have a few more slides coming up, but I'm happy to answer questions you might have. So I wanted to first talk about this um, GBA one. So this is, again, they're only um, looking for patients that know, know that they have a GBA mutation. And so this isn't everybody. Um, and it's sometimes you, you may be able to know this with other genetic testing. Sometimes you may not know. Sometimes there's a family history and you know to kind of expect it or suspect it. Um, but this, this study is really only open to people who have this particular mutation. Um, it's still very early. It's only in like a phase one, meaning this is the, the first time they're doing it. You know, they're trying to make sure it's safe. Um, and they're looking at, um, again, putting the gene therapy into the, the spinal fluid. So it's not going into the brain, it's going into the spinal fluid, like really at the base of the neck. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, the, the goal here is to increase and um, make good copies of this GBA that doesn't have a mutation. And really the, the goal here, and this is from their website, is to, um, if you have more GBA around that you're gonna actually slow down degeneration by helping to reduce inflammation and reduce all those proteins that, that we think may be junking up the cell um, and, and making the cell sick. And so this is really the, the reason why they're doing it. Um, so as I you see here, like if you have a mutation um, that of, of GBA, typically it means that that protein's not working well. And so it's not able to do its job to help clear out things like alpha synuclein. And so the, again, the idea is that we give back good GBA and this is what will, they think will help to make a better garbage disposal system so we can get rid of the, the bad proteins. So this is one of the gene therapies that's out there right now. Um, the other gene therapy, uh, and again, I'm, I'm directly involved with this one. Um, so this is the AV uh, GDNF. So this is, a, again, a phase one right now. And unlike what I just mentioned, we're injecting right into the brain. So in, directly into the putamen, which is affected in, in Parkinson's disease. GDNF works a, a, a bit differently than a lot of other um, gene therapies that have been done so far. Um, gene, GDNF specifically is a growth factor, so what we call a neurotrophic factor. Um, GDNF is required um, during development to make dopamine neurons grow. Like you absolutely have to have it or else you um, do not make 
dopamine neurons and they don't project into the PTM and like, like was normal. So the, it turns out that with um, just aging alone, you actually drop off your levels of GDNF, um, but with Parkinson's too, and, and because of all the different ways that Parkinson's happen, um, a lot of those processes cause GDNF to drop um, even further down if you have Parkinson's disease. And so this is part of the reason why we think that maybe Parkinson's happens is that we don't have that, that growth support from things like GDNF. And so that this contributes to the loss of those dopamine cells. And the idea is that if we bring back GDNF through like gene therapy, um, that we will actually be able to now support those dopamine cells better so that they can um, be healthier, function better. And the ones that were maybe sick and about to die, to stop that from happening. And the, the goal is that this will have the potential to actually slow down disease progression, uh, which is something we haven't been able to achieve with any therapy to date. And just, to, you know, again, a few little more points here. GDNF is essential for, for dopamine um, neuron, the brain cell to actually grow, but it's also needed as an adult for just healthy functioning of dopamine cells. Um, it gets lost, you know, more so in Parkinson's disease. And again, we're really looking at this to actually change the, the, the disease course. Um, and, and that's really how this study was designed and set up. Um, and I mentioned before, delivery is really a big deal. And that's one of the, the big differences in um, how we have um, set up this study and what we're doing. So previously, um, we have been taking an approach, same as what you would do with um, deep brain stimulation, where you come up from the, the top of the head and you try to get the structure kind of deep in the middle. Um, and through some more improvements, we've learned that coming from behind in the back of the head, um, we're able to actually cover the target better because um, the putamen is actually like a banana. It's, it's long and skinny. And so it's, it's a lot easier to kind of um, get more of the tissue to, to actually see our gene therapy if we try to come from this, come from the back. And sometimes the picture is worth a thousand words. So I, I'd like to show this video. So we do this in the MRI machine. So the entire surgery is done under MRI guidance. So we can see exactly where we're going, exactly where our gene therapy is going um, and, and where, you know, and if we see that it is going somewhere it shouldn't, we are able to make changes in the middle of the procedure to make sure that stays right where we want it. And also allows us to um, tailor um, our infusion. So it goes only in this place that we want. So I don't know how, much, how well you can see it on your ends, but there's this like comma shaped structure here. We're, we're trying to fill up just that one spot and only that one spot. And um, it's just trying to show you here that this, this white stuff that's coming in, that's actually the, the, the gene therapy itself. We're able to see it um, on MRI. So again, we can see exactly what we're doing and where um, our gene therapy is going. So these are, you know, just to keep in mind, this is almost 30 to 40 years of, of development to um, in, in lots of volunteers with Parkinson's, you know, um, you know, donating their time and, and their brains to, to help us get here so that we were able to do this really cutting edge research. So I'm gonna hand this over. I can talk about gene therapy till the cows come home, um, but I think it is important to talk about stem cells, especially with um, a few studies that are up and coming. I was gonna hand this off now to uh, Victor Van Lahr. Well, thank you. And uh, yes, as uh, Dr. Amber said earlier, um, some people tend to equate stem cell research with uh, gene therapy. Um, and they are different, but the end goal is the same. It's trying to improve um, the tissue that is not behaving right in the brain. I mean, the big difference here is instead of implanting a gene, we are actually implanting tissue, new cells into the brain. Um, and there's been quite a bit of research, almost as long as and as much as gene therapy on cell therapy for PD. Um, and this started back in the 1980s. Uh, here's just a timeline. You don't have to memorize all this. I'm just gonna run through it real quick. Um, but starting back in the 1980s were the first tests of actually putting uh, fetal brain tissue into PD patient brain to see if it could uh, basically turn into the proper neurons and help out with symptoms. 
Um, by and large, the graphs held worked pretty well, but not quite as well as they were hoping. Um, but that has been an encouragement to keep things going. So there have been a couple with fetal transplants. Um, as you see here, uh, there was a first opalidal studies and then there was um, a transuro study that occurred. Um, we're still waiting on the final data from that one um, as its primary endpoint happens later this year. But then as using fetal cells and embryonic stem cells became um, a little bit more of an ethical issue, particularly here in the States, um, new things were researched to try to find new ways of putting cells in. And new technologies such as derived embryonic stem cells or what we call uh, iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells. And what that means is we have taken cells from an adult and made them think they are embryo cells again. And then they're able to behave just like embryonic tissue, but without the ethical concerns because they came from an adult. And there've been several studies looking at embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells um, in, the, in the lab, but they're just now getting to the clinic, as you can see on this timeline. Within the last uh, three or four years, we have the first patients getting some of these iPSCs. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So what are we talking about when we're talking about cell therapy? Where do these stem cells come from? And here's just a little graphic that shows the primary way we get cells. So the, the fetal cells are exactly what they sound like. A embryo or a fetus is dissected, the brain is taken out and the parts of the brain that correspond with an adult's brain where the neurons are dying, the, the dopamine neurons, um, are actually taken out and implanted into the patient. The other two, um, the embryonic stem cells and the iPSCs. Um, so the embryonic stem cells, those will come from like a fertilized egg, an embryo that has not actually, you know, a hasn't actually become a complete embryo. It is just the original population of cells from fertilizing an egg. We can culture those cells out uh, before they develop and they become progenitor cells that can turn into the cells we want. And then the last one, we actually take cells from a person, blood cells, skin cells, um, and we basically do gene therapy on these cells. We add um, genes to the cells so they go backwards in time and think that they are embryonic cells again or pretty close to it. And that's what we call the iPSCs. And then those can turn again into the dopamine progenitor cells. And then once we have the dopamine progenitor cells, once we have the cells that we know are gonna turn into dopamine neurons, those are the cells that get implanted in the patient brain to replace the dopamine cells that are gone and make new dopamine. Um, there are different ways of how these cells are processed. Now, when it comes to the embryonic tissue, um, Basically, the cells are just taken, they're mixed up in the solution and um, filtered out and they can be directly implanted and they will grow into the cells that we want. It's um, clear that that's not happening right now. That's illegal. That's not happening right now. As, as I pointed out in that timeline, that was a study that happened back over the last couple of decades and is actually wrapping up. But this work actually isn't happening right now and it is not happening in the United States. Uh, the only place it's been done is in Sweden. Things that are happening right now um, in trials, uh, one of which is in the US, is the human pluripotent stem cells where we've taken an adult cell, own cells, cultured them, turned them into progenitor cells, cultured them out into dopamine neurons exactly. and then just to, I don't know if you can you describe what it means to culture. Okay, so when we take the cells out of a person, we actually grow them in a petri dish, um, in the lab, um, in an incubator, and give them all the food and everything nutrients they need while they're growing in a petri dish, and then we grow them up so that they look like dopamine neurons. We think they're dopamine neurons. These go through very rigorous testing. They're 
you know, we grow up enough of them that we have a whole bunch of them. Um, we put them in a the freezer until we have enough of them. We test them in animal studies to make sure that they're safe and they're doing what they're supposed to do and that they'll grow. Then those cells go into the patient. And as you can see, just like in gene therapy, we're not targeting the midbrain. We're again, trying to put these cells right where the terminals are lost into the, into the uh, stratum of the patient, into the putamen. Um, to replace, so they start making dopamine right where the dopamine's needed. So this is kind of like gene therapy, except instead of using the cells that are already there, we're putting new cells in to make this dopamine. And just to kind of clarify too, the study that's um, that's to be opened here soon, um, so that they are delivering it in a very similar way that I just showed you, you know, going into the brain directly. Um, and they 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 have edited the the genes for these cells again, really to make sure that they're making a lot of dopamine, um, and then can start because um, it's not enough to just make it. You have to be able to package the dopamine too. And so they're they've worked really hard to um, make sure those cells are able to do all of that. The other big um, effort that's been going on with the this particular study is to make sure that these cells. Um, stay where they're supposed to, and that they engraft themselves, and that be, they behave properly. I don't know if you want to talk about that more, Victor. Well, I mean, that is the, probably the biggest difference between gene therapy and cell therapy. With gene therapy, this, we're using the cells that are already there. We're using your body's machinery, kind of like the, uh, the new COVID vaccine. We're using your body's machinery to make the medicine effectively, to make the dopamine. When with the stem cells, we're putting new cells into the body, which when you think about PD, on the surface, it makes sense. We're losing cells, so we'll put some new cells in. But this is a foreign cell. We want it to stay put. Cells that are new to a new environment don't always like to stay put. Sometimes they will travel to different parts of the brain, or if they get in the blood, they might even travel throughout the body. And then they'll be doing something somewhere that we don't want them doing it. So there's gonna be a lot of safety work and regulation to go on with this to make sure that the technique works right, the cells stay put and that they make the dopamine they're supposed to make. Um, the other big change is to make sure these cells survive. That was actually a big problem in early days of stem cell um, therapy was just getting the cells to stay alive, you know, long enough to even get in you. And once they were in you, um, were they able to survive in the new environment? And that's, yes, that's another huge issue is, again, we're also putting, whereas with gene therapy, you're just making a new protein. You're not really, it's probably not going to trigger your immune system too much, especially because you're in the brain, which is this immune privileged organ. It's not really looking for foreign stuff. But when you start putting new cells in, there's always, just like any transplantation, this is effectively tissue transplant. The risk of rejection is always there. Now, moving forward, if we're talking about the science behind this, someday, hopefully, we'll get to the point where the scientists and the doctors are actually taking your own cells and making these progenitor cells out of that so that the risk of rejection is almost nothing because it's your own tissue being grown back up. Um, I don't know if this study is going to do that or if they already have stock cells, do you know? So they, they have developed their, their own cell line and this is what I'm saying, they've actually done um, some genetic editing of these cells in part to help them survive, to make sure they're making dopamine. But the other big thing that's a, a stem cell issue is making sure that um, um, once you're there that you actually um, integrate with the brain tissue that's there is it's not good enough just to exist. You have to be able to communicate. And this, the, whole, the, the whole brain works this way, like all the cells talk to each other. And so how do you get cells that didn't grow up with you to now behave as if they, they grew up with you? And so they've done a lot of editing to try and, and make that happen as well. Hmm. It sounds like maybe they should make these cells make GD enough. <laughs> it's, they're working on it. <laughs> That's okay. So as you can see, both are very promising things, gene therapy and cell therapy. Both are still early on, but we're starting to move to the clinic. I mean, this is a very exciting time. This is decades of research and we're finally getting to where we're gonna see if it's gonna help patients. This is, this is an exciting time.
very much. I think we only have just this table and then I really wanna open up to questions, but really just wanted to throw this up uh, just to give you a sense of what's happening with stem cells specifically for Parkinson's. And um, again, right now, um, you know, the, the, the goal is to really focus on more advanced par pa Parkinson's patients for stem cells right now. Um, especially here in the U.S., uh, that's a, those restrictions point are in the same place for others, other countries. But um, the goal is again, really just is it safe? Can we do it? Is it safe? Um, is really the main goal right now. And then obviously watching to see if it helps the Parkinson's symptoms or not. So I'd like to open up to some questions. Um, I don't know if Christine, Casey, or David, if you want to. Yeah, Dr. Van Lar, can you hear me? Yep. Um, there were a couple of questions regarding the, uh, the research that was going on. Um, Claudia asked, are healthy volunteers needed for the studies? Mm. Right now, everything I've talked about, all, all, all are um, um, Parkinson's patients. There are some trials, um, I think of the one that are looking for like healthy controls. Um, oh, which one is it? I think there's the best way is actually just to go into clinicaltrials.gov. Actually, they have it listed here, this website. Um, and if you're go look at Parkinson's disease trials, and you can actually see if there's um, healthy controls that they're looking for. Um, and then the, the Michael J. Fox, um, skip to this one. So clinicaltrials.gov, clinical any clinical trial that's worth its salt has to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. If it is not on this website, it is not kosher. I just, just to make that really clear. Right. Um, so that is actually something I really wanted to point out with the stem cells, I completely forgot. Um, as I pointed out quite, <laughs> quite a few times when I was giving that spiel is, and as uh, Dr. Van Lar also pointed out, um, you know, these are things, these studies are things that either aren't happening as in the case of the embryonic tissue or are just starting to happen in clinical trials as the case with the iPSCs. The problem is there's a lot of people out there that are like stem cell therapy, come to our clinic, stem cell therapy, we can do stem cell therapy. None of those are licensed, none of those are approved. There is no FDA approved stem cell therapy for PD out there right now. It, it's coming very soon. Uh, and so, you know, just, this is really the, one of the first places to start looking, um, you know, and I, I think what uh, Vic, Dr. Victor Van Lar is pointing out is that there is something called um, medical tourism. And I, I'm, I'm guessing a few people here have seen, you know, these um, offers of these great treatments that are gonna cure Parkinson's with stem cells, but then you have to go to like Timbuktu in order to get it done. And there's been a, a lot of um, injuries and um, even a few deaths from people um, taking advantage of, of those types of therapies. And so again, anything that's been vetted and looked at by the FDA has to be listed here. And if it's not there, I would be very, very skeptical. Any, any study that's asking you to pay for their therapy should also be a big, big, big red flag. I feel very strongly about that. I've seen too many people get hurt. Yeah. Dr. Victor Van Lar, may I make a request? We so appreciate your answering a couple of the questions in the chat, but we have some folks online who don't have access to the chat or don't know how to access the chat. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your responses to those questions verbally as well, that would be great. Okay, uh, before I do that, there's one question on here that I think would be a really good one for Amber, um, which, comes from Donna that says, or not, no, not that one, um, from Marlene that says, do study subjects remain on their prescription medication regimens or are adjustments made in order to observe symptoms? Very good question. Such a good question. Um, it depends on the study. Um, by and large, for the most part, they, they keep you on your medications. Um, some studies will say that they want you to um, try to not change your medicine. They'll try to keep the doses stable so they can see changes in symptoms that way. Um, but there are other studies that want you to feel your best. And if that means you need to up your medicine or drop the medicine, then to go ahead and, and do that. So it, it really depends. Um, 
there, there are, there were a few studies that have been done for Parkinson's where they wanted you to start in the study before you were on medication. And so there was this interest in sort of delay to see if they could delay the time to starting medication. So that that's a little bit different. Um, but it's it is such a huge part of studying Parkinson's because you know you it's you can't really have one without the other. It's it's really rare. Um, but I think by and large, most people want the Parkinson's patients to feel as good as they can throughout the study um, and uh, are typically okay with some adjustments if needed. Okay. Um, so now I'll get back to Donna's question. Um, and this is a, a good question too. Um, are there any gene or stem cell trials aimed at the gut instead of the brain to detox the whole system? So um, one thing I do want to point out there is, yes, we do have this gut brain connection that some people are researching. Um, there are people that are looking at adjusting things in the gut, not necessarily with gene therapy, but by actually changing the gut flora um, to there, improve the health of the area. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of stuff there. But now when it comes to detox, um, you know, be careful when you see these things in it, you know, like drinks or juices or things like that, this, or um, supplements or medicines to say they'll detox your system. The truth is, if you have a functional liver and functional kidneys and functional lungs and functional sweat glands, they're already detoxing your system. There, there's nothing that you're going to put in yourself to make your system any cleaner. Um, now, when it comes to the gut, that's, you know, the best thing we can do there is make sure that your gut flora is on track. Um, now, are there any trials for gut flora? I don't know. Do you know? I don't. There, there have been some studies looking at, um, so for example, there's another uh, gene mutation called LERC2 um, that actually has involvement with the gut. And so I, there are some that are looking, I think it mostly giving like probiotics, um, to see if that helps. Um, you know, there are, are also, the reason that we think this brain gut axis exists is because of synuclein. And it's really, we're saying this and seeing this because we can see alpha synuclein in the gut. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that if you can help clear that out um, with like a medicine you take by mouth, that maybe that would help. Um, but um, there's, I'd have to go back and, and look, you know, here at Fox Trial Finder or the clinicaltrials.gov to see if there was anything specific. I know that there's research in the lab on this. I have actually seen several presentations and papers looking in mouse models at uh, changing up gut flora in models of PD that um, look really promising. So if there are no trials yet, I'd be shocked if they didn't come out soon. Yeah. I just wanted to point out uh, this Fox trial finder. Um, I, I've actually found this personally to be a great resource. And I know a lot of my patients have liked this as well. Um, it, they, they take information directly from clinicaltrials.gov, but they only take the um, Parkinson studies, but anything that has to do with Parkinson's. So it's not, not always the, the big studies like this where they are it, you know, injecting things into you. It's all studies for Parkinson's. I mean, there's everything from, you know, you're you know, wearing a Fitbit to having brain surgery. So um, this is a really great resource if you haven't been there before. Um, what other questions do we have? Uh, let's see, one was related to travel from Karen. Is travel away from home involved? Um, it depends on the study. So for, I can speak to our study with GDNF. Um, especially with COVID and patients who may be, um, it's hard to get around. Um, what we've done is actually try to make a lot of the assessments um, remote so that there are things that you can do on an iPad that you don't need to come all the way into clinic for. Um, we're able to actually, um, we've hired a service to do blood draws at home. Just all, there's a lot of ways of getting around it. Um, but you, there's typically some, some travel involved, especially when we're talking about like brain surgery, you know, we, we really, no way I can do that remotely. Um, but the, the idea is that, you know, it, it's some, there's definitely some investment there. Um, it's been, you know, difficult with COVID, but not impossible. I think the, um, happy medium here is to do something in between and more of a hybrid way. Um, and, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to get very quickly back to the uh, trials for gut flora. Um, so there's one that is not yet recruiting, but it seems to be pretty stalled because it's been around since 2018. 
Um, and there's another one for looking at like a certain, like a sp specific kind of uh, maltodextrin treatment for the gut um, that is currently recruiting in Chicago. So there are a couple trials. Um, nothing really addressing the flora. Well, the one addressing the flora is the one that's not recruiting yet. So we're talking about the kind of um, food. So I just wanted to get that out there real quick. Um, so we can get back to the gene and cell therapy questions. Uh, Paul had a question. Uh, first, the comment, the Biden administration has allocated monies for dementia and some other diseases in the new federal budget for cures, which is great. Hopefully Parkinson's will, be, will benefit also. Do you see more interest in the federal government towards research? I mean, I, I wish I had this graph up right now, but I mean, as far as um, gene therapy specifically, the it's huge. I mean, it has, I mean, gone from a couple of studies a year going to the FDA looking for, um, you know, guidance on gene therapies to well over 200. I mean, it's, it's exploding. And so, yes, I think there's a lot of interest. From the government specifically, you know, that's where um, we need to start talking about how clinical trials are done because a lot of um, big clinical trials for um, Parkinson's and a lot of other diseases, this is all driven by industry um, because it's usually often too expensive for the government to do. Um, however, when it comes to trying to do these things in the lab, that's where the government steps in. And absolutely, there's a big time interest in really specifically regenerative medicine so then this, this goes beyond Parkinson's. This is all neurodegenerative disease. There is a huge interest. There's a lot of money going into this because I think that we, people are seeing that this, um, that the tech has evolved. Um, and I, I think that they see that there's a lot of hope. So yes, yeah, so the regenerative medicine specifically, there's a, there's a huge effort, especially for the, the brain. And as I'd answered Paul, typically, support for sciences, particularly brain sciences and brain diseases, has had pretty good bipartisan report, support in Congress. It's just the amount they're willing to support that's typically been the problem as funding levels tend to lag behind you know, the growth of research and research costs. Um, so that's why it's always important to make sure that your senators and representatives know how important this research is, how expensive this research is, it, was. <laughs> it helps. If they know, you know, they're, they're going to make sure the money goes where it needs to go. There is, you know, having been involved with the Fox Foundation on some of this, um, actually Victor and I both went to um, DC a couple years ago trying to advocate for this. And I, I think that they know, I mean, there's, there's a ton of people with Parkinson's and the numbers are growing. You know, and I think they're with this more, you know, clear link with like pesticides and other toxins out there. Um, there's a lot of um, need for legislation um, around controlling some of these substances that are out in our environment too. So, um, you know, don't be shy. That's what I'm trying to say. Just a little history also. Um, Jim Cordy, who was kind of the founder of the organiz our organization, sat on uh, a Senate hearing with Michael J. Fox next to him, and they uh, both made passionate pleas for increased funding. And I think that led to the Udall bill, which really increased the amount of uh, funding for Parkinson's disease specifically. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, it may, may seem like it's a small part, but, you know, in total, this, this is really how we keep it on the forefront of their minds that this, this research and money is needed for a lot of people, you know, and it's, I just thinking when I was lecturing to medical students, you know, I, I, I'd ask like, how many of you know someone with Parkinson's and it's always a couple, you know, it's always a handful. So I, again, just to speak to how common this is and that I, that there's just such a frustration, I think on everybody's side that, you know, that we're, we're still here and that, uh, that yet it seems like we're close enough to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And, and just as a sidebar, when you were talking about uh, procedures and research that might be suspect, um, Benzi Kluger oh, has a uh, blog that uh, it's detecting medical bullshit, if you'll excuse my vulgar language. I um, and I put, a, <laughs> I, I put a link into the chat if anyone's interested, because, uh, you know, he is quite a researcher and... Uh, movement disorder specialist, and even though it's uh, more of a general detector, 
it really can help guide folks when they're looking into either bizarre therapies or, uh, you know, great claims. You just don't want to see people get hurt or, or, you know, waste their time and effort on something that is, you know, not likely to be helpful. So I, I, I he's, um, he's done a great job. Now, there's a reason we have clinical trials. There's a reason we have the FDA. There's a reason we have all of this oversight. It's, it's you know, not to protect the pharma industry or anything like this. It's to protect the patients. It's to make sure that the medicine that finally gets out there is safe and effective and you're not wasting your time or your money or potentially getting hurt. That is a, another, a whole other topic, I have to yes, say. That needs to be a whole other day. Um, so there was one other one. Uh, so you answered the one about clinical trials and travel. Yes? Uh, yep. So there was another one, um, where do the new genes come from that are used in gene therapy? Yeah, well, that's a good one. Um, so uh, basically there, are, we know the sequence because it's very, uh, we all have the same sequence for uh, GDNF, let's say. Um, and so we're able to actually take all the same components uh, that would be, that your body would make on its own, string them together to make basically synthetic DNA. So it's not coming from anyone, but we're using like the, the code that we know from like the human genome project and then building, basically making a copy of what we know is the right, the right code for the DNA. So it's, a, it's not coming from someone or anything like that. It's, it's made in the lab basically. And it's not coming from a fish or a mouse. Or <laughs> it's, it's typically human genes or human code genes. Um, so, your body has less reason to reject it because it's almost identical to something your body already makes. What else we got? Uh, the last one here was, what have we learned from the COVID-19 vaccine and its delivery that could help Parkinson's patients? Anything? Um, one of the things is that they're actually using um, this one. Instead of this um, the yellow envelope I have here, use, instead of using basically an AAV, they're using um, what we call like a nanoparticle or a lipid particle. So the, the packaging is a little bit different. And so I think we're learning a little bit about um, other ways of packaging genes that are not using like a vector, for example. Um, this study, the work like that has been done. Um, you know, and I, AAV has been remained like the main you know, envelope or carrier for us because it's a bit better. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping we'll learn better ways of getting better delivery from like these lipid part, the, the little particles that they're using. And that's actually a good point is the, uh, the major difference here between the gene therapy that Amber was talking about and the vaccines that are coming out is the gene therapy is delivering a gene, it's delivering DNA and it's going to be, it's going to stay, it's going to be durable, and your body's going to keep making that gene for the rest of that cell's life. With the vaccines, we're delivering the messenger, the mRNA, um, not DNA. And so the cell only reads it for a little while. Eventually it breaks down and it's not there anymore. So your body doesn't keep making it. So this is a transient event, a short-term event. Um, so that you're not constantly making the protein. We just want your immune system to see it for a little bit and then have it go away and wait for it to come back again. And so we can attack if you ever catch the disease. So that's the big difference there. It's the length of time this stuff's being expressed. So, so Amber's right, we're learning a lot about how we can deliver things, but the packages we're delivering between the vaccine and gene therapy are radically different. I'm trying to see, I have a figure, but it's not in this presentation. I hope with that. Okay. And then we have uh, from Christine, uh, a, a really fun question. Um, if we had unlimited funds and could start our own clinical trial, what would you want to try? <laughs> Can I go, let me go. I mean, as it is, I mean, we all have our own little pet projects because I am still in the lab. I do research, so I'm actually on the discovery side, I'm always looking for new targets and things to put in. So I actually did just put in a grant looking at a protein that would make mitochondria work better. Again, getting kind of like GDF, getting at this idea of making the neurons that are there healthier so that they keep working longer and can fight off the disease better. Um, 
and, and the best part about targeting something like the mitochondria is it might be applicable to all uh, degenerative diseases. So not just Parkinson's, but also Alzheimer's and ALS and Huntington's. So you know, again, that's- What do mitochondria do and, and why would that be helpful to, to make- And so mitochondria, um, I think we've mentioned before, but mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. So that's the little part in your cell called an organelle that actually makes the energy to keep the cell running. The problem is as my, if mitochondria have hiccups, they can actually damage the cell or they can get to where they're not making enough energy and that hurts the cell. Um, so my idea is we can put stuff in to make the mitochondria healthier and that'll make the whole cell healthier. Um, what I want to do is to um, use a growth factor and try to reduce synuclein at the same time. I think this will address, you know, a, a wide breadth of symptoms. And this is really more applicable to things like Parkinson's and other Parkinsonisms. Um, and so it's not as, as maybe broadly, you know, applied to other diseases. But um, I, I think this is really what we're going to need to do in order to really get at um, Parkinson's as a whole. Um, this is going to, I think we're going to start seeing more, more groups that are, um, approaching this like we did with cancer decades ago. I mean, cancer is really rarely treated with, with one drug. Typically you need two things to, to really make a difference. And I, I, I bet you we're gonna really start seeing that here in, in the few, next few years. So yeah, um, dual therapy or multi-therapy, you know, maybe multiple gene therapies or gene therapy plus drug therapy. Like this is probably gonna be where this goes as we learn more about these emerging techniques is what can we put together to make it work even better. Exactly. I mean, it's it, sometimes we got to be able to treat the symptoms as they are right now, while also trying to prevent things from progressing or getting worse down the road. And, and that's, that's really why I think we're going to need, you know, something more than just a, one drug. Here's a really good question from Donna. Do we know why some Parkinson's patients seem to take um, sudden step downs rather than a gradual decline. There's a lot of reasons why that may happen. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes when I see that, it makes me wonder if it's not Parkinson's disease, but maybe some other Parkinsonism. So there's that. Um, sometimes the Parkinsonian symptoms um, they're because of um, changes in the brain that are due to like basically tiny little strokes. Um, and that can cause someone to like, you know, be fine and then decline and then be fine and then decline. So they have what we call a stepwise decline. And so that would always kind of make me wonder, you know, what was the cause? I would maybe want to look at the brain. The other reason why someone would have a sudden worsening is because of something else that has nothing to do with the Parkinson's directly. So sometimes getting sick, um, you know, a cold, a UTI, I mean, just normal, regular things. Um, can make someone feel like they're suddenly worse. And it's it's just because your body's dealing with this other illness and it's allowing the Parkinson's to really kind of rear its ugly head. Typically though, and what I've counseled patients with before is that if it's really just something temporary, you, you should go back to where you were um, before the symptoms started. So um, I don't know, clinically, I would if I was in the clinic, I would wanna know a little bit more about the context and be able to know better, but um, you know, just to keep in mind, the Parkinson's brain is very sensitive to any kind of stress. And that could be getting sick. It could be, you know, um, your kid just wrecked the car or, you know, even good things like weddings coming up. Um, those are all reasons why Parkinson's will suddenly feel like it got worse. Um, it's just, uh, it don't, it makes it hard to play poker. <laughs> Stuff comes out really, really easily when you know, the brain is stressed from other things. We've got a good bunch of questions rolling in here, but we'll probably have to wrap up before too long. Um, one that's really good given uh, the gene therapy stuff, how do you know that the growth factor enhancement is targeting the right area? Mm. So one, one way is that we know when we look at patients' brains who have passed away and they had Parkinson's and even other type of Parkinsonism, so, um, and you, you look, the parts of the brain that we're going to are the parts of the brain that are most um, have the least, like the biggest drop off in things like GDNF. So that's that's one thing. Um, we also know that there are, 
you know, GDNF specifically is really the um, the key for dopamine cells. So that's that's why we think it's the um, the ideal one for this particular situation and where we're we're going. Uh, has there been any investigation into how to prevent PD symptoms um, from also causing dementia? So this kind of goes back to what I was some of what I was saying earlier. So we think that the PD dementia. And this is when we start talking about dementia with fluid bodies, because it gets to be a real gray zone. Um, and the thinking is that um, for whatever reason, that person is having more alpha-synuclein depositing in parts of the cortex. And the cortex is the kind of the outside of the brain that really does the, the thinking and um, the planning and it helps us communicate. It's the, the more elegant parts of the brain. And the idea is that for some people, for reasons that I think are still, we really don't know just yet, but for whatever reason, um, they tend to have more alpha synuclein getting um, junked up in cells in the, the cortex. Um, so it's, it's really all to do with the, the burden and how much synuclein is going and, and where that seems to make the biggest difference. They've looked at, you know, done these big, you know, looking at big populations to see if there are um, indicators of who's going to go on to get demented. And it, it's not, it's not clear. I mean, if there's pre-existing um, like um, memory problems and by the time you're diagnosed and you're already having memory problems, it raises concern that you might go on to have um, cognitive impairment. Um, the older you are at the time of diagnosis increases your risk of developing um, memory problems and um, dementia. Um, but this is really, really important stuff um, um, because again, I mean, in my perspective, it'd be great if we could stop disease before it ever gets there. Um, but the other big thing is, you know, how do we help the people who are there now? And this is where I think it's you know, needing to address the synucleans uh, as a big, big player in that. Um, can you speak about genetic counseling and how it would benefit mm -hmm. those with PD? Mm -hmm. So crazy thing, 10 years ago, maybe being more like 15 years ago now, um, no one actually thought that there was um, any genetic link to Parkinson's, not that long ago. And um, it's really been in the past decade or so that we started to realize like, there, oh wait, there are a lot of genes that we think are involved. And um, it's just in the past few years that now that we have, you know, 23andMe and there's actually the Fox Insights and the Parkinson's Foundation, the, the big one in New York, they have their own like gene um, testing that they will do um, for a low, low cost. Um, people are starting to learn stuff about their genetic status that they never would have known before. And um, there, our study and others are starting to do gene testing as well. And um, the, uh, we now know a lot more than we did before. So what do we do if we find something? So there's actually neuro, like neuro-specific genetic counselors. They're rare, they're rare, but they do exist. And they're really getting a lot better at um, trying to understand what these mutations might mean. Um, so I think it's important to keep, you know, know like what, what kind of mutation it is, what gene is mutated. And then, you know, I think sometimes when we're talking about like genetic counseling, we're starting to then wonder what does it mean for my children or my grandchildren? And right now it's very, very rare to have a gene that is your guarantee. There's nothing that's guaranteed that you're gonna go on to get Parkinson's. We don't really have a gene like that to date. The one exception may be in a very rare family, there's, um, they have like a triplicate repeat. So they have two, three extra, two extra copies of alpha synuclein. And so they make a ton of alpha synuclein. Those, that family and that, and then I think they're Italian, that one little group is likely to go on. Most of the other genes are not a guarantee you're gonna go on to get Parkinson's. So I had to keep all of that in mind. And again, this is an area that's still, you know, it's fresh and it's growing every year. There are new genes being added. And so, you know, to keep, keep in mind that that story is, is evolving. And, you know, if you ask me this again in a year, I think it'll be different. Um, people with DBS are not typically permitted in trials. 
But since uh, Medtronic has that brain sense capability um, to know more about the effect on the trial, could you learn from people with DBS and brain sense if they were permitted in the trial? Um, I am talking about this all the time. <laughs> so um, I know um, there is a lot of interest in that. Like, what, what can we learn? Um, and, you know, I, I, I see this as a, it'll, it'll come, it'll come. I think that there's a lot of concerns with um, trying to do like a head-to-head -head studies of, and this has been an interest, like, you know, gene therapy and, and DBS together, like what, what, what's better? We're, we're just not, none of these things are mature enough to, to do that quite yet. So one last question here. Will gene therapy address dementia aspect of PD? I will let you know soon. <laughs> I, I think there's a ton of interest in this. Um, you know, there's, you know, I think actually in the, the prevail study, specifically that one with the GBA mutation, um, the, the patients that have GBA mutations tend to have more cognitive problems. And it's because they have more synuclein that's getting, um, you know, junked up and built up in, in more cells. And so one of the things that they're trying to do with that study is to, to see if it has any impact on reducing dementia or slowing it down, things like this. Um, but I, I really do want to say, I, I think where this is going is it's just not good enough to treat the motor symptoms. Like levodopa can do an okay job. The big thing is like, how do we get everything else? And so I, I, I hear you loud and clear and um, let's just say we're, we're working on it. <laughs> Anything else? Um, just one last thing, Christine. Has sorry. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I I'm always talking and I'm muted, but <laughs> I, I'm sure my wife wishes she had that. But <laughs> uh, um, Claudia had one other question. What are the other Parkinsonisms? Uh, okay. I, I I hesitated because I, I don't want to overwhelm. But um, so there's. Parkinson's disease, and then there are several others that look, that I call the mimickers of Parkinson's. So that's multiple system atrophy, cortical basal degeneration, um, para, uh, <laughs> um, and then the PSP, so um, parasupranuclear palsy. Um, there are other causes. So there's, you can get what we call like a vascular Parkinsonism. So that's where you get lots of little strokes in the brain um, that can make someone look like they're demented or that they have um, Parkinson's in the lower half of their body. Um, we also, you know, call things like, um, you can get Parkinson's-like syndrome from the, uh, like the Spanish flu way back in the day. Um, we call that something a little bit different, but these are all things that mimic Parkinson's disease. Um, but the way that they, they may present like that um, but the way that they change and um, evolve over time looks very different. And that's, that's how, in part, we distinguish them um, in the clinic. I would just want to add the most common one out of everything I just mentioned is multiple system atrophy. Great. Well, I think uh, we should wrap up. It sounds like you guys both have places to be shortly. Um, just a reminder for everyone that we have a couple of great programs coming up to kind of bring Parkinson Awareness Month to the end. Uh, we have Capturing Grace tomorrow, uh, David Leventhal, who is the director of Dance for Parkinson's, or Dance for PD, excuse me, and Dave Iverson, who was the director of uh, Capturing Grace, will be with us tomorrow. They'll uh, do a really nice Q&A after we see the movie. Um, so please, if you haven't joined in for that, I think the weather's going to be lousy. So this will be a great matinee for us. Um, and then the following week, the 24th, we have our uh, Set for Life kind of mini conference. We have three medical professionals, Dr. Alan Cole, Dr. Karen Jaffe, and Dr. Dan Stoltz are going to be joining us. Um, not only do they have the medical and the insight into the you know, the pathology of the disease, but they also have the disease. So they're going to have some great insight into uh, what's worked and what hasn't worked and maybe some guidance and counsel for folks that are, you know, looking for additional information on that. 
So I think that's it. Doctors Van Lar. I, I really like this kind of tag team thing you have going here. <laughs> it takes the pressure off us too. So thank you. Thank you very much. Can I give a quick shout out? Yeah. Okay, yeah. John Cavicchio, I want to know where you are because I'm really jealous. John Vasquez, I need to catch up with you. Bill Caps, hi, how are you doing? And Dale, oh. I saw you in there somewhere too. I just need to say hi. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I like the Cavicchios are in Florida. I was just going to send him an email complimenting him on his tree. <laughs> it's good seeing you guys. I miss you. All as well. Thank you so, yeah. so much. Yeah, thank, thank you guys you. very much. And hopefully we'll get you back on uh, next month. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. We'll see you, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>